Welcome to this second panel of the policy forum uh, for the uh, Congressional Renewable and Energy Efficiency Clean T Technology Expo. Uh, it's amazing how quiet it just got. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I am Carol Werner, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And of course, we are honored to once again put this on in conjunction with the Congressional, the Bipartisan Congressional Renewable and Efficiency uh, Caucus. And of course, EESI is a nonprofit that was organized by a bipartisan Congressional Caucus to work on issues of energy and environmental uh, issues, sustainability to be problem solving. Um, and we've been doing that for over 30 years now. So I uh, wanted to just make sure to repeat that again. Uh, so let us get this policy panel underway. Uh, we have some wonderful speakers here. And our first leadoff speaker that, uh, for this panel is Kayla Prendergast, who is a program associate for the Building Clean program of the Blue Green Alliance. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and thank you, Carol, for that introduction. Um, also, thanks to the rest of the staff at EESI for putting this great event together. We're so appreciative. Um, today is a great opportunity to bring prominent leaders together to discuss the connection between America's clean energy economy and good jobs for American workers in energy efficiency sector, particularly in the often forgotten energy efficiency manufacturing industries. My name is Kayla, as Carol said, and I work for the Blue Green Alliance Foundation's Building Clean Initiative. At BGAF, we believe solving our nation's environmental challenges will create and sustain good jobs, strengthen American manufacturing, and build a strong, clean energy economy. But what are clean energy jobs? Most people might answer that they are solar and wind jobs. But in reality, energy efficiency jobs are so much, or clean jobs are so much more than that. Energy efficiency is the largest and fastest growing job sector in America's clean energy economy. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, energy efficiency is the number one largest energy resource in the United States. And energy efficiency workers are the workers that install energy efficiency products in buildings and homes and workers that are manufacturing these products across the United States. In fact, there are more than 2.3 million Americans working in energy efficiency today, which includes construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade, engineering, sales, and many other jobs. In fact, in 2018 alone, more than 76,000 new jobs were created in the energy efficiency sector, continuing the trend of the energy efficiency seeing the highest percentage growth of all the energy sectors. Also last year, more than 320,000 Americans were working to make energy efficiency products, with one out of four in energy efficiency, energy efficiency appliance manufacturing specifically. And this just includes products like Energy Star refrigerators, Energy Star washer dryers, and other Energy Star products that you can find in the home or other commercial spaces. Um, and this growth is not expected to slow down. Next year, domestic manufacturing jobs and energy efficiency are expected to increase by nearly 6%. And it could be even higher if we link our energy efficiency spending to the purchase of local, and if it's not available locally, you know, just American-made um, goods and equipment. It is promising to see sustained job growth in energy efficiency, and we need to do everything we can to keep that growing. Energy efficiency strengthens small businesses, which we all know are the backbone of the American economy. And according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, roughly 70% of energy efficiency jobs are in small businesses. It's clear that energy efficiency opens doors across America. You will find energy efficiency workers in all 50 states and 99.7% of all US counties. Manufacturing and construction jobs deliver good jobs with sustainable wages and benefits for families. And these are the types of jobs that we need more of to regrow and protect a strong American middle class. And these are a few of the reasons that we need to support building energy efficiency efforts and link them to incentives to create market demand for US products. Utility incentives, government rebates, procurement policies, and product rating systems are all a part of this larger strategy. At Building Clean, we do our part by helping built environment professionals find US-made products. 
We maintain a public database of over 4,500 U.S. facilities that are, manu that are manufacturing energy efficiency products and parts across the country. The database can be found and is featured at buildingclean.org. And on buildingclean.org, you can find U.S.-made HVAC systems, insulation, lighting, plumbing, roofing, sealants, appliances like we already mentioned, windows, doors, skylights, and even water filtration systems. But you know, revitalizing American manufacturing is not the only thing that energy efficiency can do for this country. The benefits go beyond reducing energy usage, beyond saving money, beyond helping the environment, and beyond creating jobs. Though that does sound like a pretty good start. Studies show that health and the built environment are undeniably connected. Billions in health-related costs can be saved through the same work that improves energy efficiency, energy efficiency in residential and commercial spaces. In fact, according to the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, nearly 9 million families across the nation live in unhealthy, energy inefficient homes, which leads to $82.4 billion in healthcare costs nationwide. Increasing demand for energy efficiency residential retrofits creates a unique opportunity to simultaneously address energy consumption and improve health, health outcomes for Americans. Improving the energy efficiency and quality of our built environment empowers Americans to live healthier, more productive lives. Energy efficiency in the built environment can create healthier spaces, reduce energy consumption, and deliver good jobs for Americans. So let's work together to fully realize the potential of the clean energy economy and all of its benefits. And you know, thank you for attending this panel, and I invite you to come visit us at the Building Clean table. If you have any questions, we'll be here all day. Thank you. And I should also mention that uh, EESI just finished up a jobs fact sheet yesterday, and so that will um, uh, also be on, you can find it on our table, and Kayla's right there. There are so many exciting things happening in this space, and it's a terrific opportunity. So we will next hear from Adam Goff, who is the policy director at Eight Rivers Capital, as well as the policy director for um, NET Power. Uh, thank you, Carol, uh, for setting up this event and giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Adam Goff. I'm the policy director for Net Power, and I'm going to talk to you about how we can produce zero emission electricity from natural gas. Uh, to do that, first, I'll explain the technology um, that we use to do this, and then second, I'll talk about what role this can play in the clean energy transition um, and what role policy can play in helping us cut CO2 emissions faster. So net power is a new way of making power from natural gas. Most power plants in this country drive a turbine with steam or with air. Net power actually turns CO2 from a problem into the solution. We use a CO2 turbine uh, to make power. So net power uh, is a joint venture of Exelon, uh, Occidental Petroleum, McDermott, and Eight Rivers Capital. And we invented a new power cycle that first burns natural gas and pure oxygen. The air around us is actually mostly nitrogen, so by taking out the nitrogen, when you burn in pure oxygen, you eliminate all your air pollutants. So there's no NOx and no SOx generated, and you get a pure stream of CO2. Next, we use that CO2 to drive our turbine. So that CO2 is what gives us a high efficiency, and at the end of that CO2 push in the turbine, we have it already purified and captured, so we can store it uh, deep underground uh, in sequestration. So I know many of you have heard about carbon capture. The general challenge is that it's expensive, and you are legally allowed to release your CO2 up in the atmosphere if you so choose. The thing that makes our technology different is that we have no choice but to capture the CO2. Since the CO2 is driving our turbine, there's no additional cost for us to capture it. It's captured inherently as part of our power cycle. So this is a breakthrough in carbon capture in that it makes the marginal cost of capture no, nothing additional after you've built the power plant. So where are we today? Uh, we've raised $150 million from our uh, three partners, and we've built our first plant down in Texas. So if you're ever in the Houston area, we have a 50 megawatt plant uh, down right outside of Houston in LaPorte that's demonstrated this technology uh, using that pure oxygen and driving the turbine with CO2. Um, our next stage in development is building 300 megawatt commercial plants. So we take this technology and we scale it up to 300 megawatts. Uh, we've got six or seven plants in development around the world. That's where net power is going. Uh, what role does it play in the clean energy transition? I know many of you here are most familiar with solar power and wind power and renewables, uh, which are our fastest growing clean energy sources. Net power can help balance 
uh, those renewable energy sources. Right now, the U.S. builds many gigawatts of combined cycle gas a year that releases its CO2 into the air. That combined cycle is actually very helpful in balancing renewables for when, uh, when it's night and the sun goes down or when the wind is variable. We use that combined cycle to balance um, our more variable renewable energy. Net power can play that same role, but without any air pollution and without any carbon emissions. We can ramp up and we can ramp down and play a balancing role uh, for renewables. And uh, per the gentleman's earlier question on the first panel, we can help decarbonize gas in the power sector. Uh, so this, you know, very uh, large supply of natural gas the U.S. has uh, discovered um, through fracking and the shale revolution. We can turn that into something that doesn't harm our climate by burning that gas in a clean way. Uh, so the U.S. is definitely the best place to build this technology, but we see a global deployment potential. So since we have no additional cost of CO2 capture, we think we can hit the same price as conventional generation. So when we've built five, six, seven of these plants, we are planning to be at the same or lower price point as combined cycle gas or pulverized coal. When you do that, you really change the clean energy conversation. Just like right now, solar is at price parity or below with coal or gas, you then see that technology being built out in China and India and countries that don't necessarily have the capital to spare to build more expensive power. Net power can hit that same point where it is economic to deploy it in China, regardless of whether they have any price or incentive on CO2. To get there, we do need policy support to build the first couple plants. Uh, the U.S. actually in 2018 passed the 45Q tax credit. This is part of the budget deal in February. It pays you $50 a ton for every ton of CO2 that you sequester underground. That is what's going to allow net power to build its first uh, handful of plants and get up to scale. Uh, that it's, a, it's a pretty large incentive, so it gets us between 30 and $50 million in revenue a year. So we have the carbon incentive we need to get this technology up to scale. Uh, the things we need further to help us utilize that, there's two fixes to 45Q. One is called the Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax. Uh, it's pretty arcane uh, uh, tax details about how 45Q is treated um, for certain new tax code elements introduced in uh, tax reform in 2017. The second is called American Energy Bonds that allows you to split up 45Q so you can get a more varied investor base in this clean energy projects. Um, additionally, we're supportive of the carbon capture R&D bills that are currently going through the House and Senate. Uh, Senator Cornyn introduced the Leading Act for Natural Gas Carbon Capture, and uh, Senator Manchin also has the Effect Act, uh, which authorizes carbon capture R&D at Department of Energy. So we think net power can play a big role in helping accelerate clean energy and reduce CO2 emissions in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, thank you for your attention. We have a booth at the Expo, so if you have any further questions or want to get more into the chemistry of how exactly we're able to do this, uh, please come talk to us. Thank you. Thanks so much. And as you've heard, there are just all sorts of solutions. And as we look at these problems it, and recognize that there are problems, challenges that we must face, it is totally driving lots of innovation and great new ideas. So we are now going to turn to another company that is very, very, has been very innovative for years. Um, we are going to hear from uh, Arlen Peters, who is the head of sustainability for Nova Science. So, uh, thank you, Carol, for setting this up. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, thank you all for coming today uh, and giving us the opportunity to share our story and also discuss a vision for greener chemistry. So I'm Arlen Peters, as was mentioned. I'm head of sustainability at Novozymes uh, North America. And just a little bit of background on Novozymes in case you haven't heard of us. Uh, we're a biotechnology company um, in the US. We're headquartered in North Carolina. And what we do is we find biological tools in nature, and we figure out a way to apply those tools to various problems that we see. Uh, we are able to produce greener biofuels, for example, improve animal health, reduce water usage in textiles production, uh, and improve the quality of food and the quantity of food that we produce in agriculture. The main tool that we use is something called an enzyme. I don't know, has anyone heard of enzymes before? Yeah, okay, great, I'm seeing some nods. Good, good. For those of you who have not heard of those, uh, you basically need them to live. So these are catalysts that we have in our body 
Uh, they allow us to function every day. In fact, if you are breathing right now, you are using an enzyme that takes CO2 out of your cells and releases it into the air. So really, really amazing stuff. Uh, we use these to solve all sorts of problems, and in fact, um, our technology is a significant way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions all around the world. In 2018, we calculated that we were able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 88 million tons. That's about the equivalent of taking 37 million cars off the road for one year. So pretty powerful stuff. But um, I'm not here to talk to you about just enzymes. What I want to talk to you about um, are eco-friendly cleaners and detergents. So uh, how many of you here care about the environment? Just a show of hands. All right, good, good, all right. How many of you care about the environment so much that you're willing to buy an eco-friendly green detergent? All right, awesome, okay, good, me too, all right. Um, so I, I know that you all have purchased those uh, green detergents. Uh, chemical uh, detergent manufacturers have noticed this uh, trend too. In fact, 86% of new detergent launches uh, in 2017 uh, were uh, eco-friendly or had eco-friendly claims. So that's great, but the problem is that a lot of times these detergents don't work so well. Right? So you've probably had the experience of maybe uh, getting your shirt uh, with a dollop of chocolate ice cream, going to wash that shirt, using an eco-friendly detergent, maybe washing in cold water so that you're you know, extra gentle on the environment, and thinking to yourself, man, what a great global citizen I am. Then you look at that shirt and you're like, oh my gosh, that stain is still there, right? So you're not the only one to have noticed that issue. In fact, Consumer Reports in 2017 highlighted that problem, stating that detergents actually that make green claims often haven't delivered the same performance as top-rated detergents. So at Novozymes, we've taken this as a challenge. Right? How do we use our technology to create a, the most eco-friendly detergent possible while still maintaining performance? And there are several levers that we can, uh, that we can pull to do this. First, uh, we want to make as concentrated a detergent as possible. Right? Why? Because by increasing concentration, you reduce all sorts of negative uh, issues in the value stream. You're able to use less raw materials, less packaging, uh, less weight in transport, and also less chemicals down the drain. Second, we wanted to try to make a 100% bio-based product so that the ingredients come from renewable resources rather than petroleum. Third, we wanted to use a completely recyclable and ideally bio-based uh, plastic in the bottle. Right? And then finally, we wanted a formulation that could operate super well in cold temperatures, right? Because we know that wash temperatures are probably the biggest lever that you can pull in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, this is the, uh, this is the concept uh, that we produced. Uh, and I can assure you this is not a hip flask, so <laughs> didn't take a nip of this before, uh, before starting my uh, presentation today. Um, so, uh, we've cut out all the essential, I'll cut out all but the essential ingredients. So we've gone from 30 ingredients down to 13. Uh, it's 100% bio-based. Uh, it's using a, uh, a plastic that is 100% uh, re recyclable. Uh, and we hope that in future iterations, uh, it will be, uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, create a, a, a bio-based plastic as well. The best thing about this detergent is that it works as well as top tier detergents uh, in the marketplace today. So if you want to learn more about it, uh, you can talk to us at our booth uh, outside here. I will mention that all of the ingredients in here are available on the market to get today. Right? And needless to say, this biological detergent would not have been possible without enterprising companies creating better alternatives to traditional chemistries. Many companies would like to transition to alternatives uh, with the needed functionality along with desired health and environmental profiles, 
but one of the most significant barriers to such transitions is the lack of adequate chemical alternatives. Why is that? Well, first, there is no comprehensive approach to research and training in the sustainable chemistry field, meaning most chemists and chemical engineers graduate without any exposure to sustainable chemi chemistry curriculum. We need to have sustainable chemistry taught in the chemistry curriculum. Second, we need significant focus and research to accelerate the development of more sustainable chemical alternatives. The federal government can support that effort, but while there are existing federal programs that have elements of sustainable chemistry, there's little coordination between agencies and programs to maximize um, our federal investment in this area. So we believe that with a few changes, we can get more out of, out of the programs that exist. That is why we support the Sustainable Chemistry Research and Development Act of 2018. There's a Senate and a House version of this bill. Um, these bills do not regulate companies or spend additional money, but rather create a coordinating entity within the White House OSTP that will assess the various existing federal R&D programs that touch on sustainable chemistry and identify gaps and overlaps. The bill would also establish an advisory panel made up of business, academic, and NGO experts to advise the government on research needs, allowing federal R&D efforts to be better targeted towards market needs. So basically, this bill creates better coordination among agencies and programs and allows for the better use of current resources. So feel free to join us and others, including the GC3 Sustainable Chemistry Alliance, Procter & Gamble, BASF, the Environmental Working Group, and LEGO in supporting this legislation. It's one of the best things we can do to ensure that we have safer, greener alternatives to conventional chemistry. As I said, if you want more information, we're in the foyer. Uh, and feel free to take a look at our mighty little 100% bio-based detergent. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Well, something else that we have a lot of in this country is solid waste. So we are going to now hear from David Biederman, who is the CEO and Executive Director of SWANA, the Solid Waste Association of North America, uh, because here is something that we need to find to treat as a resource. Thank you, Car thank you Carol, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is David Biederman. I'm with SWANA, the Solid Waste Association of North America. We're headquartered up in Silver Spring, Maryland. We're an association with more than 10,000 members in the United States and Canada, and we appreciate the opportunity to participate again in this great annual policy forum. And we also have a booth in the foyer around the corner if people would like further information about what the association does. So, SWANA's members work in both the private sector for companies that you may have heard of like waste management as well as for hundreds of local governments all over the United States such as the New York City Department of Sanitation or here in DC the District of Columbia's Department of Public Works. So when you put your trash or recyclables out on the street um, in a container, uh, it's one of our members who probably picks it up. So what I'm going to talk about here today is recycling and the potential role that the federal government can have in supporting this important activity that millions of Americans do every day. But like the prior speaker, I want to take a little test here, quiz, uh, ask some questions. How many of you think recycling is important? Raise your hand. I see two people who didn't raise their hand. How many of you, how many of you have read something recently that recycling's in trouble or there's something going on with recycling? Okay, most of the room. That's terrific. So. You're, you're, you're well versed in that, then in what the current situation is. Recycling programs in the United States, they face serious challenges right now. Now, it's not collapsing, contrary to some of the uh, articles you might have read in the newspaper or seen on the internet. It's true that a handful of towns have eliminated curbside recycling, and a slightly larger number of local governments have narrowed the, the types of materials that they're willing to accept in recycling. Oftentimes, they're taking out Low, what we call low value plastic, the very thin plastic out of recyclables. But every day, thousands of trucks all across the country are collecting recyclables from homes and businesses. So what's, what caused the current problems we're having with recycling? 
So two years ago, China announced that it was going to stop taking recyclables from the United States and from other countries as part of China's broader effort to improve the environment for their citizens. This matters here in the United States because at least one-third of all the recyclables that are generated here in the country used to be sent over to China. And after China imposed its restrictions in early 2018, a lot of recovered paper and plastic began showing up in Southeast and Asian countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. These countries don't have the infrastructure for managing these materials properly. So they began to restrict the import of this material as well. And in fact, some of you might have read that several nations in the region have started to send back containers of waste and recyclables to Canada and Australia, among others, claiming that there's too much trash mixed in with the recycling. This trash, which we refer to in the industry as contamination, is a very important part of this story. So as a result of this disruption in the marketplace, the value of the recovered paper and plastic generated at recycling facilities all across the United States has declined by at least 50% over the past two years. And recyclables are worth even less when they're heavily contaminated. Now, Americans continue to recycle with great fervor. We, we do a lot of recycling, but they often put the wrong material in that blue recycling bin. Generally, 15 to 25 percent of the material that's processed at a recycling facility is contamination. It ends up at a landfill. You'd be surprised at what people put in the recycling bin. Dirty diapers, hoses, Christmas trees, plastic bags, batteries, and electronics. Waste management reports that they receive up to 100 bowling balls every week, every week at their recycling centers. So SWANA and others are educating Americans on how to recycle right, but it's a national problem that requires federal assistance. So how can the federal government help? So we're working with the United States Environmental Protection Agency to develop a national framework on recycling, which is going to be released on November 15th as part of America Recycles Day. The national framework is going to focus on four key areas, education and outreach, developing more domestic markets for recyclables, improving the recycling infrastructure here in the United States, and identifying the proper metrics and measurements to use to determine whether recycling programs are performing well. But Congress also has an opportunity to provide leadership on recycling. SWANA is part of a broad-based coalition requesting congressional funding to support local recycling programs. Specifically, we're seeking support for the Recover Act, which would provide money to local governments and others to educate Americans on how to recycle right, help them upgrade outdated recycling equipment, and develop new markets. The overwhelming, Americans want to overwhelming majority of Americans want to recycle and are even willing to pay a little bit more for the service. But there isn't sufficient domestic capacity to manage all the paper, plastic, metal, and glass that we generate. And as I mentioned earlier, Americans need some help in recycling right. And if you don't believe me, check the recycling bin at Union Station for what I'm talking about. <laughs> Congress can encourage additional investment and improve the recycling system here in the United States through the Recover Act. Now, recycling is a nonpartisan issue. There isn't a Democratic way to, or a Republican way to collect and process recyclables. And recycling is good for the economy. It creates jobs here in the United States and needed tax revenue, billions of dollars in tax revenue. But it's also good for the environment, as recycling means we don't have to cut down more trees to make more paper or mine more ore to make more cans. And it also preserves landfill space for what's really needed to go to disposal, like those dirty diapers. And it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. The small investment that the Recover Act would authorize would be a win-win for both the economy and the environment. Lastly, earlier this year, an international treaty known as the Basel Convention was amended. This would require exporting countries to provide prior notification if they're shipping recovered plastic to importing countries. This amendment is going, going to take effect in January of 2021 and was enacted in response to the growing marine litter problem. It's going to significantly restrict access to foreign markets for recycled plastic. This just adds additional pressure to the need to improve our domestic recycling systems. Some action is already taking place. Companies are making plans to only use recycled content 
by 2025 or 2030. And some states and local governments are passing laws to try to address these situations. And we are seeing some improvement in the contamination rates in a handful of jurisdictions, including right here in the District of Columbia. But it's not enough. A great deal of adaptation and change is needed in a short period of time. So as I said, this is a national problem that requires federal action. And I want to end by uh, quoting from a letter that was actually in the trade publication yesterday from the US EPA to uh, Congressman, uh, Congressperson Haley Stevens in response to her concern around recycling. Um, the letter states that no one organization has the resources necessary to address all the challenges to our materials recovery system, so significant progress requires collective action. That collective action will take place with federal assistance and be successful. Thank you very much. <laughs>
um, and just advancements in the technology. Um, but more recently, what we've seen, which is also very encouraging, is increasing demands from consumers um, for renewable power um, and also corporations. So utilities have responded by saying, hey, we're going to make some, some strong commitments uh, to move to renewables. One utility in the Midwest just announced they're going to go 100 percent renewable by 2050. Um, so that's been great. So what I'll argue, though, <clears throat> is that a lot of um, what we've accomplished and a lot of what we're going to depend on going forward is our ability to invest in a robust, um, nationally integrated electric transmission system. Um, so most don't know it, but that's not what we have now. We have a, a local and a regional transmission system that grew that way um, organically over the years. Um, but what we're going to need to move to is, is much more of a regionally integrated grid um, that can move the power from where it is um, to where it needs to be. I and mean, that's because most of the renewable resources that are really cheap that we have in this country, and we have a lot, um, are located in the middle of the country where it's hard to access them, and we just don't have the grid infrastructure um, right now to do that. So to get more specific about that, right now in the, the middle of the country today, um, we have a situation where there's actually a huge backlog of renewable projects that are waiting to get on the grid. Um, so these are conceptual stage projects where developers want to move forward, um, but they simply can't because the, the wire's capacity uh, just isn't there. Um, and as long as that situation persists, um, you're going to have a power system that relies more on fossil fuels um, than it probably needs to. Um, so I come from Michigan, um, and I used to live in Wisconsin. And there, um, there's a grid organization that oversees the whole transmission grid. Um, it's called MISO. Um, and there's such a backlog of renewable projects there that it might take as long as 10 years just to plan out the system to figure out what wires we need um, and how to get those online to help those projects get out of the queue. Um, so my argument, uh, in short, is that the next great hurdle in sustainability and in climate policy is going to be a massive upgrade to our electric uh, transmission grid, which will help to bring these projects online, um, and it will help to do it at the lowest possible cost um, to facilitate the transition to renewables. We also have to make sure it's done in a resilient way, um, so the more renewables you have on the system, the more wires you need to be able to, when the wind isn't blowing somewhere, the sun's shining somewhere else, but the wires are the way that you um, make all that work together. Um, so I wanted to point to just at least one example of how this has worked really well in the past, and that's from somewhere that might be surprising to some, and that's Texas. Um, so about 20 years ago, Texas realized that they had a really great wind resource, um, but the problem they had is that it was located um, in the north and the west part of the state where no one lives. Um, the people live on the east side of the state for the most part. So what they decided to do, because they had this chicken and egg problem of no grid but lots of wind, is build the grid first. Um, and then use that to help facilitate the interconnection of that wind. Um, for lack of a better analogy, I'll call it uh, the field of dreams type policy. If you build it, they will come, it being the grid, they being renewables. It turned out to be wildly successful, and um, Texas quickly became a national leader um, in wind output. Um, so if I, if I will leave you with one message today, it's that when we talk about climate policies like carbon tax, the things you hear about all the time and that get a lot of debate, we really need to include in that first tier of policies a grid-first investment strategy um, to integrate as many renewables as possible as cheaply as possible. Um, that's going to take a lot of policy alignment um, at the federal and the state level. It's very complicated to get transmission built, um, but we do need to be more proactive about it, um, and we need to do it really yesterday to get all this uh, to work together the way we need it to be. So I'm uh, going to stop there. Wires, I know, has a booth. I don't have handouts up here, but they have plenty of handouts, and our website has lots of great studies and information about how transmission plays a role uh, in sustainability and the renewable transition. So thank you. Thanks so much, Devin. And uh, we have worked quite a lot with WIRES before, and if any of you are interested, we have uh, done a number of briefings that are on our website so that you can learn more about that. Uh, one of the things I think is so important is it, there's so much talk up here about infrastructure and it, and so it's really important to remember that the grid is a really, really critical piece of this country's infrastructure in terms of how things run, work, uh, whatever, so we just always need to be aware of that. And so there's lots of exciting things going on in that whole sector as well. We have a few minutes, so uh, we can take a few questions. Okay, go ahead. Just wait for the microphone. Uh, this 
is for Adam Goff. Um, I'm wondering, I, I think I uh, hadn't heard of net power before, but I think it sounds really fascinating. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, although the power solution in itself won't result in um, emissions, which is fantastic, obviously fracking in itself causes a lot of environmental issues. So I'm wondering uh, how the um, net power solution more broadly speaking, might address the environmental problems that come with fracking, like um, the risk of earthquakes, water contamination with chemicals, things like that? Uh, that's a, a great question and something we do think a lot about, but is also a challenge for us because we don't source our own gas. So I think the burden on us is to find the most uh, responsible uh, source of natural gas for our projects. Um, we do think a lot of the issues with natural gas, which are certainly real, uh, can be solved, where you can get natural gas out of the ground and you don't have to inject it and cause that earthquake problem we're seeing in Oklahoma. Uh, I think methane leaks you know, are a huge issue, and uh, I care a lot about climate change, and we shouldn't be leaking uh, CH4 in, into the atmosphere. Additionally, when we buy natural gas, we're buying CH4. So there's also an economic incentive there for if we don't leak that methane, we can actually use more of it in our project. So there are real challenges. Um, as a producer of power, we will do our best to solve them and also think that we can be, you know, have the lowest emissions of any natural gas power. I think for all of us who work in energy, you know, every single energy source has challenges. And so, you know, we're always working through those challenges. But by eliminating the air emissions and the CO2 emissions, we think we can, um, be a responsible citizen and a clean producer of power. Thank you. Other, other questions? Okay, I see a hand. Claire in the back. Okay, just wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Uh, question for the gentleman from Swana. Um, are there? Can you talk about the policy landscape for uh, incentives to encourage either you know reuse of specific materials or um, material science to develop new products using end use materials from recycling processes? Sure, there's a, a, a patchwork of uh, incentives across different states uh, to encourage reuse of material. Um, there are take back programs in certain states, but there's no federal law or regulation in this space. There's a uh, EPA and Department of Agriculture policy on food waste, but that's sort of separate from what I think you're, you're talking about. Um, the, the, the patchwork that we have is part of the problem. And um, I talked specifically about recycling, and part of the problem is that over the last decade or so, we forgot that the hierarchy is reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycles last. We need to reduce our waste output. We need to reuse the things that we're, we're doing in a, some sort of circular kind of way, um, and then recycle as best we can. Um, good question. I've been reading a lot also in terms of circular economy. I think there's more and more conversations about that. Julie. I have this question. Well, hold on. Julie, just wait a second. Okay, there you go. Hi. Thank you, everybody. Those are great presentations. Uh, this question is for Novo Zymes. Um, I wonder if you could just speak briefly to the work that's going on in your sector on using a wood based feedstock for a replacement for plastic products. It's a really good question. Um, I know that there uh, have been a number of efforts to try to find uh, sustainable sources of uh, raw material that can go into making bio-based plastics. Um, and we have been involved in a number of efforts to produce the technology that can convert uh, things like um, uh, sustainably sourced sugars or woody biomass and convert those into sugars that can then be converted into, uh, into bio-based uh, bio plastics. There are a number of plant-based pa plastics out there, um, plant-based PET, for example. Um, but I would say uh, at the moment, um, a lot of those alternatives are, are somewhat more expensive than, uh, than current, uh, current plastics uh, or petroleum-based plastics. And it's really incumbent on the industry to try to improve those economics. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of activity, um, you know, in R&D from a variety of players. I know the, the U.S. government has, has funded a number of, of projects through USDA. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that we'll get to a point where, where some of these things are, are cost competitive to, to the alternative. Thanks. So 
I would just encourage you and Julie to follow up because Julie's with the Forest Service and they are looking there there are once again all sorts of issues with regard to thinking about how we can approach a more circular economy that can solve multiple problems all at the same time which is also really exciting right um, other questions okay we'll do one here and one here and then that will be it Thank you everyone for coming. I love the diversity of uh, solutions across the board, whether it be wind, carbon dioxide, chemical enzymes, recyclables. Uh, one source of energy that I'm curious about, and it, this is for the panel, whether it be policy barriers or whether you see uh, innovations taking place is nuclear energy. So I'm thinking the sun, it's a clean source of energy. It's uh, fusion from hydrogen to helium. Uh, is there any research going in? And I understand nuclear energy also has the radioactivity uh, contention with it. Uh, but from your aspects as professionals in this field, um, any comments on that? OK, thank you. Does anybody want to talk to that? Uh, I'm out of my depth here, but there, there is an advanced nuclear industry in the U.S. Uh, Congress passed 45J, which provides incentives for advanced nuclear. I'd recommend looking into New Scale uh, or Terra Power um, or Oklo are three of those advanced nuclear companies. I won't pretend to have the nuclear chemistry background to tell you uh, how they work, but th there are solutions to reducing the waste uh, from nuclear generation and, and third gen nuclear plants. And I might just mention, you know, the, obviously the focus of, of the expo and the, the forum has, is on um, uh, efficiency and renewable uh, related technologies. And I would also be happy to talk to you a little bit further afterwards. Okay, we have one other question over here. Thank you. So my name is Wero Nia, but you, I'm also with the Forest Service, R&D, Forest Products. So we deal with a lot of these things that's so-called green and sustainable. So I guess one of the questions I've, we've always have in mind that when we design these research projects that, I mean, how much value does green sustainability actually bring to a product? I mean, I go to all these similar meetings where it's at the interface of technology and policy. You know? uh, when we look at it, you know, a lot, lot of these products that's considered green and sustainable, it's, it's actually because they have special properties that customers need, not necessarily because they're green or sustainable. There's always going to be a small group of customers that want something that's green, regardless. They really need to sacrifice some of the property, performance properties. So I guess I, guess I would just want to hear firsthand from people here and you know, from industry. What's your take on that now? Do we actually need to use a property, performance property, to bring the green aspect of a product to, to, the, to, to, the, to, to, to the buyers? Or I mean, ultimately, you're, you're here to make money, not make products, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say something to that. Um, so uh, that was actually 100% um, be behind our thinking for trying to produce a, um, an eco-friendly detergent that actually works. Uh, because we know that customers often aren't willing to sacrifice the performance or the quality of products uh, for green attributes. There is, as you said, I think a, a small segment of the population that's willing to do that. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny, we were talking to one of our customers, seventh generation, uh, their CEO came down to, you know, to talk to our employees, and, and um, he was telling us about you know, how people love their products. And in fact, one of um, their customers told him that, man, I really love you guys. I loved your product even before it worked. <laughs> but, but that's not good enough, and they recognize that. And so they, they want to make sure that we, you, you can have both worlds, and I think the effort now is really to try to, try to find both the performance and, and also the green attributes. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that there's a growing percentage of the population that places a higher emphasis on the sustainable nature of the product than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, et cetera. And so what we see is we see a lot of research being done and how to build better material. We actually did a conference call with Argonne National Labs earlier this week about a research project they're doing uh, with regard to doing something with all the plastic, right? And it's gonna take research and it's gonna take a lot of engineering that's way above my brain power to create, you know, something like this that isn't, that, that's fully uh, recyclable in all curbside uh, programs throughout the United States. This is not a recyclable cup, right? It says it's compostable, 
We've been working with paper for centuries. If it goes to the right place under the right circumstances. So we have a lot of, we have a lot uh, uh, to do, and there's a definite role for the federal government here in being a leader. And thank you to your department for the role you guys are playing. Well, and I must say the Forest Service does a really good job, and we need to empower them to do a lot more in this whole space. And, and if you would also note, this also links right back into thinking about the kinds of economic activity and jobs that Kayla was talking about as well. So I want to thank you all very, very much for being here and to all of our speakers and for um, putting forward some very, very thoughtful questions. And please go visit these folks in terms of their booths. Engage in conversations because that's how we're all going to make a difference. So thank you all very, very much.